You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Yelp Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Yelp will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, Dr. Vernon Smith, who is in the economics department at Chapman University, and he's the winner of the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics, along with another former guest of the Goldstein on Gelt Show, Professor Daniel Kahneman. Vern, Vernon, a real pleasure to have you on the show. Well, Doug, thank you for inviting me. So your area of economics is really quite fascinating. You do what's called experimental economics. Could you give us a, a, a short summary of what that's all about and why it differs from what other economists do? Well, essentially, we use controlled experiments, either in the laboratory or the field, sometimes both, uh, to test theories about behavior in market and social settings, to discover regularities in behavior. An important part of what uh, I and Tout colleagues do is to test, kind of test bed new markets. Try them out before we actually introduce them into the world. For example, various kinds of uh, auctions or trading systems. And these are all rule governed markets and so we, that's what we test. All right. So one of the things I know that you are involved in, in testing and looking at is housing bubbles. But this seems like something that can't be a controlled experiment because, quite frankly, for many people, it seems rather explosive and painful and random. Are you able to actually develop a controlled experiments when looking at housing? Well, yes, in the laboratory. And that's where we get most of our understanding about sort of the elements that are going into uh, to bubbles out there in the world. And, and what we do, and I want to contrast them with, with another kind of market where you never see any kind of bubbles. And that's where uh, uh, in the macro economy is market for non-durables. These are things that you can't retrade. Most people don't probably realize it, but about 70% of private product cannot really be retraded. So by that, you, just to clarify, you mean things like soap and products you would use around the house that you're saying are Yeah, not hamburgers or... and haircuts, Got hotel it. rooms when you rent one, you buy an airplane seat, a right to tr go from A to B. Those things, you buy them to use them, actually consume them. And, and that's most of the products of the world or of that kind. And those are incredibly stable. If you study them in the laboratory, people converge quickly to, to the equilibrium of, those, of, those, of supply and demand that we can control in the laboratory. And out in the world, they tend to be very stable. They hold up even in, in pretty severe recessions. And thank goodness they do. So in other words, most of the instability in the economy comes from the stuff that's retradable. And a very pro and particularly long-lived goods. Uh, and a prominent example of that is is houses. Mm -hmm. You know, people can. You don't. You see, if the price of hamburgers goes up, you don't change from being a buyer to a seller. You may <laughs> buy less. Well, if the price of houses go up, you may decide to. Maybe you own two. You decide to sell one. Or maybe you only own one. You decide to sell it and move into rental property. These are all things that you can do in that market. So this applies to housing and stocks and long-term bonds and gold yes. and commodities? Yes, all securities markets, anything that's kind of storable is potentially of that form. But, but the, the main trouble comes with things like homes that people buy largely with uh, other people's money, mainly mm -hmm. mortgage credit. And if they collapse in price, it's against fixed 
long-term debt, and that right away impacts the equity of the household. Presuming that there will be inflation, and not that past performance guarantees future returns, but historically there always has been inflation over periods that long, then you're going to be returning that deflated dollars, and what could be a better deal? You borrow $100,000, but you really only have to return uh, future dollars, which are are worth much less. So shouldn't that make this a constantly growing field? Yes, and that does uh, have a big effect on housing markets, but sometimes they can turn south in a big way. They did in 1929 and they did in 2007 in the United States, and they turned down, uh, there, was a, there was a deep decline also, this is what the origin of troubles in Japan in the early 1990s. A huge real estate boom turned into a collapse. And, that, and their, mar their economy suffered for probably 20 years as a result of that. And, and you can, so you do have these turnaround periods that are v extremely painful <laughs> and, and, and explain the, the great depth you see of the Depression and the Great Recession, whereas most, most recessions are not that painful because they, it's just a little blip in housing. It isn't anything like this big, big collapse. Right. And of course, that's exacerbated if you owe money on the house. We're talking with Professor Vernon Smith, the 2002 Nobel Prize winner in economics. His area is experimental economics. Let, let's focus a little more on the real estate concept, but I'd like to drill into how do you do experiments on the real estate market to really understand the bubbles? Well, the, the experiments that we started with, and this is back in the mid-80s, early to mid-80s, uh, and of course we'd had a lot of experience with supply and demand markets, and they just worked astonishingly well. Well, we decided to look at at markets where people could uh, retrade and maybe we could get some uh, bubbles going. And we started out and we had a, had a, people were just trading an asset that had a yield that, and we called it a dividend yield. So the, the, the concept was like securities. But of course, a, a home yields a rental yield to you. That is, it's an alternative to renting. So conceptually, it's, it could be thought of as quite similar. And we told people, gave people complete information on the dividend, that's, and there's going to be a draw at the end of each period. And so the fundamental value was well-defined. And, and we thought that would be an environment where there would be no bubble because it was very clear we were telling them all that give them all this information and we were astonished we got bubbles and we thought we were creating an environment where we wouldn't get bubbles and the idea was then to see if we can create them well, Sorry, was, we this, found, was uh, this all <laughs> academic in other words people literally sitting in a room or were you dealing with people dealing with their own real money and you were just kind of guiding them well we pay them real money uh, that is, we give, them an, we give them cash endowments and share endowments in the lab, and they each are they're going to trade on a, they sit at a computer screen, okay? And okay. it's a bid-ask, uh, continuous trading market. In that sense, it's very much like a securities market, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and the... The value is well defined each period. It it shrinks over time because you're using up draws. Okay, each each time at the end of the period you you draw uh, a yield, a dividend, then it's one less that you're going to have in the future because the game only lasts say 15 periods. So it declines in fundamental value, and we tell and we. Remind people each period, hey, there's only 10 periods left, and the fundamental value, the dividend on average is 24 cents, so the fundamental value is 10 times 240 is $2.40. Is, uh, they pay no attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> 
absolutely no attempt. We just get these big bubbles and then crashes near the end. Bring them back a second time, and the bubble is doesn't. Ha- is, it's still there, but it's not as high a volume. And the third time, they finally begin to get it. Sorry, so you're saying that the pe- the players in your experiment actually grow up. They become more mature in terms of their ability to invest as opposed to just being traders in this market. Yes, and for example, if you endow one group with more cash, one group of of people are going to who are being exper- so, say we replicate, we run say we might run four experiments with high cash to share value. Uh, the same number of experiments with different uh, subjects with low cash to share value um, ratio. And we get bigger bubbles if there's more money. Okay, more money, bigger bubbles. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's the analogy there is in uh, housing markets. If, if credit is easy and there's a large inflow of mortgage credit, you tend to get a bigger bubble. <laughs> and you had had that huge inflow of mortgage credit. You see, from 1997 to 2006 in the U.S. housing market, and then it flattened and it started down, and and just you know, uh, it really collapsed. So we're nearing the end of our time, so I just want to ask you the question on that. A lot of people blame the legislation that was forcing the banks to give low quality loans. Is that is that what led to this or encouraged that to happen? Well, they're all thing, things like that were going on, but and and you had a lot of of public housing programs trying to encourage, you know, making it easier for low income people to get into houses. There was that was going on, but that really a lot of that was not particularly new. That is, Fannie and Freddie had been subsidizing housing for you know for decades in the United in the United States. But it is true that once that bubble mentality started to take hold, and it was pretty well along by 2001, then all kinds of people were trying to, you know, find ways to make uh, people of modest means uh, do better, get more wealth by getting into a home. Right, and I guess they believe this time was different, right? That's what they always say. Well, yeah, but there, there was... I, I tell you what, there were plenty of problems both in the private and the public sector. For example, in the private sector, we had upfront fees for originating a mortgage. Well, if you get your money up front, you, you know, you really, and, and then are selling the mortgage out the back door, you just don't, you, you, the due diligence starts to go out the window. You see, and you need to give have have incentive scheme, incentive means of giving loan originators the same incentive that a that a lender would have. Mm-hmm. We we propose spreading the fee. In our book, rethinking housing bubbles, we propose f- uh, spreading whatever the fee is over the life of the loan in proportion to principal repayment. Well. If you want to make a, lo- a ten-year interest-only loan, it means you get no and uh, no principal payments for ten years, and you get no <laughs> fee for ten years. Got it, so that's- You're free to do that. But in other words, you, you you try to give people reasonable, more reasonable incentives here to behave themselves. I hear that sounds like a, a, a fascinating proposal, Vernon. We are just about out of time, but tell us in the last minute how can people follow you and learn more about the book and learn more about the research that you're doing now. Well, if he, uh, the uh, Economic Science Institute site at Chapman University uh, is the place to go, and they can go in there and click on various options and learn a lot about what they do, and they also find out about the the outreach workshops we do. Okay, as and well as the book, right? Rethinking Housing. Yes, Bubble. and I tell you what, we're working on water markets in California, and we'll probably have something here going. To sh- for people to access uh, sometime in the next few months. All right. Well, we will keep an eye on that here at Goldstein on Gelt. And as that comes up, we'll invite you back on to share with our listeners what you're learning there. Professor okay, Vernon Doug. Smith, I really appreciate your taking the time, and I wish you the best of luck with your research. Thank you, Doug. 
You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.